This week on ANN, the US Supreme Court accepts a workplace religious discrimination case supported by Adventists. Two Adventist hospitals in West Africa temporarily ceased clinical operations due to the effects of the Ebola virus. And the World Church unites in prayer for the growing Ebola epidemic. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the highest court in the United States last week accepted its first workplace religious freedom case in nearly 30 years. The case of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission versus Abercrombie and Fitch stores was one that the Adventist Church and other faith groups urged the U.S. Supreme Court to grant. The case involves a Muslim woman who was denied a job because her hijab head covering violated corporate policy. Church leaders feared that a ruling by a lower court could erode workplace religious freedom rights, including Sabbath observance. In August, the church, along with seven other faith groups, filed an amicus brief, which is a friend of the court brief. A date for the oral argument has yet to be scheduled. Dwayne Leslie has more on the significance of the nation's highest court taking the case. Well, this is actually the first time since 1986 that the Supreme Court has actually taken a workplace religious freedom case. And this should provide some additional clarity to job seekers who have Sabbath accommodation issues or want to protect other holy days so they can have some additional clarity and not be discriminated against in the application process. Two Adventist hospitals in West Africa have been severely affected by the growing Ebola epidemic. Currently, the World Health Organization reports the Ebola virus has infected 7,500 people, killing 3,500. In Sierra Leone, the Waterloo Adventist Hospital has closed to the public due to several of its hospital staff contracting the Ebola virus. Three people have died and the hospital has been placed under quarantine. After the quarantine period, the hospital will be taken over by the Sierra Leone government and will operate as an Ebola treatment clinic. In Liberia, Cooper Adventist Hospital was closed after two staff members were suspected of having contracted Ebola in the community. For the safety of patients and staff, the hospital was closed and placed under a self-imposed three-week quarantine. The hospital is planning to reopen after the quarantine is lifted. Dr. Peter Landless, Health Ministries Director for the Adventist Church, said surgeons are lined up through Adventist Health International to continue the much needed non-Ebola emergency care. So the church, together with Aloma Linda, Adventist Health International, its director and president, Dr. Dick Hart, have been working with ADRA, the General Conference Administration, Health Ministries, to work in a very focused way. We must at all times during this whole crisis remember that people are the core. It's compassionate, caring, loving ministry which is needed at a time like this. World Church President Ted Wilson has called on our global faith community to observe Saturday, October 11, as a special day of prayer for the West African population affected by the Ebola crisis. In addition to the day of prayer, Adventists worldwide are praying every day at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Elder Ted Wilson has more. My dear fellow believers, I want to encourage you to lift up God's people in West Africa this coming Sabbath. What an important area of prayer life this is to help our people who are challenged and suffering in a very difficult situation, facing the Ebola virus. Join me in praying for God's people this coming Sabbath in a very special way. To learn more about the prayer campaign, visit Adventist.org slash United in Prayer. If you've been looking for a way to keep up with Seventh-day Adventist Church President Ted Wilson, we have some good news for you. This week, the Adventist Communication Department relaunched the Presidential Perspectives blog. It's a one-stop shop to keep up with the news and sermons of the church's top leader. Communication Director Williams Costa Jr. has more. The world today has many voices. 
and people has many possibilities to search about one subject in different places. It is very important and meaningful to have one place that people can hear the voice of the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide. This is why we have this blog. The Adventist Church in the U.S. state of Arizona recently opened its first refugee center, making it the first center of its kind in the church's North American region. The refugee center is designed to meet the growing crisis and challenges among refugees in the state. The center staff is comprised of professionals and lay people, including clinical chaplains, mental health practitioners, and pastoral counselors. The center offers courses in English, Bible studies, life skills, and citizenship. Refugees also have access to a clothing center and job training. As tens of thousands of residents in northern Colombia are suffering due to drought, humanitarians are meeting practical needs during the time of crisis. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency in the nation has distributed more than 2,000 food kits to families in La Guajira. Each food kit will supply a family with enough provisions for two weeks. ADRA volunteers will continue to work in the affected region as the drought continues. Students in Norway recently made record sales by selling books for an Adventist publisher. As a result of a three-month stint with the Norwegian Bokflag student program, more than 50 international students delivered a record profit of 11.5 million kroners, or 1.8 million U.S. dollars. The students were able to keep 45% of the sales. Coming up, the Church's Humanitarian Agency reflects on its vision. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa together and pray and fast for me. Do not eat or drink anything for three days and nights. I and my maidens will fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Welcome back, and now for more news from our global church community. Leaders of the Church's Humanitarian Agency recently used an anniversary ceremony to reflect on its mission. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency last week commemorated its 30th anniversary with a Friday evening Vespers program. Numerous agency and church leaders attended the Vespers to celebrate ADRA's ministry, including World Church President Ted Wilson, Church Vice Presidents Jeffrey Mambwana and Ella Simmons, representatives of Loma Linda University Health and Adra's current and former presidents. The program culminated with a prayer over a representation of Adra's 5,000 worldwide employees. Dozens of residents in northern Portugal recently learned practical ways to make healthy choices at a health expo. More than 70 volunteers from local Adventist churches organized the Expo Saudi program despite adverse weather conditions. Attendees learned about stress management, smoking cessation, nutrition, and family life. As a result of the Expo, seven attendees expressed interest in further Bible studies from the church. Portugal wasn't the only country that recently experienced a church-sponsored health expo. The city of Gaborone, Botswana was home of the VIP Health Expo. The three-day event was led under the direction of the healthcare professionals from Kanye Adventist Hospital, Botswana Adventist Medical Services and individual practices. In addition to sharing vital health information, the Adventist Church sponsored the remodeling of Gaboron's City Hall. The Expo was a collaborative effort between the Church in the Southern Africa Indian Ocean region and the Church in the United Kingdom. 
Months of evangelism among small groups in Peru culminated this week during a web evangelism series. The distribution of more than 20 million copies of a book written by the speaker of the series, Pastor Alejandro Burion, led up to the Only Hope Seminar. The six-day event was live streamed from the auditorium in the region's administrative office in Lima. And finally in the news this week, the Church in the United Kingdom recently released a documentary about Adventist conscientious objectors during the First World War. The film, Matter of Conscience, talks about what was known then as the Great War and also gives background to Adventist pacifism stretching all the way back to the American Civil War and the battle against slavery. The 27-minute documentary is available online for free at hopetv.uk. But it wasn't just a simple choice. It's something that they had to vigorously debate. Adventists actually start to say, should we be holding ourselves aloof? Is this not a just cause? Should we not be willing uh, to, to, to bear arms? You think of the, the battle hymn of the Republic, you know, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. This is, a, this is powerful rhetoric, and Adventists actually conduct a debate in the pages of the Review and Herald about should we be declaring ourselves to be a peace church in these very particular circumstances. But the issue that leads them eventually to saying we should be conscientious objectors is not simply killing. Uh, there are those indeed who basically say, well, we'd be happy uh, to bear arms and to kill in the cause of abolishing slavery, but... Um, if we're in the army, how are we going to be able to keep the Sabbath sacred? And in the end, what finally tips the balance is not simply saying, as Adventists, we cannot kill somebody. It is that as Adventists, we cannot fight in an army. And that includes that you will be doing violence to other people who have been created by God, but also includes the egregious moral behavior and even more includes the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, I emphasize this because it does mean that the Adventist position on non-combatancy that seems so straightforward is actually ambiguous from the start. And now let's turn to Angela Taipei for a social media segment. This week, learn how you can participate online during the upcoming special day of prayer for the Ebola crisis. Since October 1st, we've been inviting all of you to pray daily with Adventists around the world at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. for the Ebola crisis and to set aside October 11th as a special day of prayer. As of September 28th, over 7,000 cases of Ebola have been confirmed in West Africa, and we've also seen cases appear in the United States and Spain. On Twitter and Facebook, we asked where you were praying from and we heard from Kenya, the Philippines, Indonesia, the USA, Brazil, Peru, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Dubai, Nigeria, China, Haiti, Germany, Jamaica, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Japan, England, Zambia, France, Ukraine, Beirut, Mexico, Egypt, South Africa, Afghanistan, and so many other places around the world. In the first week of the campaign, together, we've invited over 2.7 million people online to join us in prayer. October 11th will be a powerful day as we come before God with one voice. Share pictures with us as you gather with family, with friends, or as a church to pray for the Ebola crisis. We'll be watching on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for images to share with others around the world encouraging them to join on this special day. Just make sure to share your pictures with the hashtags United in Prayer and Ebola Crisis. If you want to see what others are sharing, visit the United in Prayer tag board for up-to-date posts shared across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also follow along with the Adventist Church Twitter account and Facebook as we share a small glimpse of the prayers around the world. Still ahead, taking a moment to spiritually refuel. But up next, how a simple tech storage device can turn against you.
Welcome back. Can a USB storage device really sabotage your computer? John Beckett explains bad USBs for this week's Tech Corner. USB devices have become widespread and are now the way most things get plugged into our computers. They're the way we plug in our keyboards, our printers, our mice, and also these handy little flash drives that are so popular for storing and sharing files. Earlier this year, security researchers described how USB devices could be reprogrammed to infect computers with malicious software, sidestepping the antivirus software. At the time, the researchers did not release the code for how to do it. However, a new pair of researchers has just released a working example online. This means that attacks involving USB devices will begin if they haven't already. The basics of the problem are this. Every USB device has a microcontroller inside which tells the computer how to communicate with the device. The computers trust the USB device's microcontroller and do as it requests. So the researchers figured out how to reprogram that microcontroller with malicious code. This means that a USB flash drive might do something unexpected like redirect your web traffic to a fake bank site instead of a legitimate one, or run commands to install malware. It also means that an infected USB drive might spread that infection to other drives. The IT community is scrambling to figure out how to detect and defend against this, but the problem seems quite difficult to fix. My perspective is this. For right now, the attacks don't seem too widespread, but we need to monitor the situation. Secondly, we need to be much less trusting of the things we plug into our computers. The way we commonly share these USB sticks around at meetings and in the office may need to come to an end. For things that are not highly sensitive, sharing through a cloud service like Dropbox can reduce the need to pass around the USB sticks and dramatically reduce the risk. If you want to learn more about this, Google search for bad USB. Do you feel a longing to make a deeper connection with God? Perhaps your spiritual life needs a refuel. Pastor Robert Quintano shares how you can connect with God in quiet moments. Every car needs to be refueled, whether it's a modern Marvel or an old Ford Model A like this one. At some point, every car needs a full tank of gas, and we, in our spiritual lives, are the same way. We too need to be filled up. So, when you're running on empty, spiritually, how do you fill up? There are many ways of doing this, but one of the easiest and most helpful ways is to spend time alone with God. No cell phones, no computers, no scheduling appointments or to-do list, just you and God. It can be early in the morning or late at night or on a beautiful day like today in a quiet place only you know about. Maybe it's a beautiful outdoor spot like this one or maybe it's a quiet place in your home. The when and where really doesn't matter. Find a way to spend time alone with God. He is waiting to refuel you and get your relationship with Him back on track. For this month's Health Ministries feature, Dr. Peter Landless shares how you can gauge whether your mental and emotional health are on the right track. When people have had a recent illness, be it surgery or uh, an infection, a pneumonia, uh, they're not ashamed to talk about it. But when individuals have had a problem related to their mental or emotional health, this is something that we don't talk about. Why don't we talk about it? Because people may think that we're really not mentally well, that we are not balanced. We need to change that kind of attitude. Mental health is something which is vitally important, something we need to talk about, and something which needs to be destigmatized. In other words, when people have a situation which relates to their mental health, we really need to sit up and take note of it. What are the kind of things that come into mental health? 
how you feel. Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Do you have times of severe worry and anxiety? Uh, are there things that trouble you? Do you feel downhearted? These are indicators that tell us whether our mental health is good or bad. Are we sleeping well? Are we doing those things which we've always enjoyed doing with the same keenness of mind and spirit, the same kind of enjoyment? If you're not, you need to think carefully about the fact that maybe your mental health, your emotional well-being is not what it should be. And if that is the case, we're going to share with you some thoughts and ideas as to what can help you as you consider the best emotional and mental health. If you have a medical practice or work in a hospital or health center, Hope Channel has a free giveaway that your patients can enjoy. Carmen McMurdy has more. Here at Hope Channel, we love coming up with new free offers for you, our viewers. Except this time, the free offer may not be relevant to you, but we're sure you know someone who can use it. Health Bites is a collection of 49 short videos on a more than two hour long loop that is perfect for patient waiting areas. This DVD will make the patient's waiting experience a positive one, filled with videos about the latest research, exercise, recipes, and more. Plus, Health Bites does not have any sponsorship advertisements. So if you know a physician or community health center, or if you work in a healthcare setting, just get a free copy today. Complete the online form at hopetv.org slash healthbytes. All one word, and we'll send you a free copy of Health Bites. That's hopetv.org slash healthbytes. It's just our way of saying Hope Channel cares about the well-being of your community. For Hope Channel, I'm Carmen McMurdy. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, the opening of what is now known as the Mission Hospital Phuket in Thailand. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On October 5, in 1898, in the northern United States, the Montana Conference was organized with 335 members under W.B. White as its first president. Today, it has 4,000 church members. From October 5 through 10, in 1909, the Finnish Mission held its annual session in Helsinki. It reorganized as the Finnish Conference, part of the Scandinavian Union. Frederick Anderson, a Swedish-American, was elected as first conference president. From October 6 through 9 in 1921, a general meeting of Polish Adventist workers was held in the city of Bydgoszcz, with European Division President Ludwig Konradi presiding. It organized Adventists in Poland into the Polish Union Mission, consisting of the Poznania Conference, the Silesia Galicia Conference, and the Warsaw Mission. On October 9, 1940, Phuket Adventist Hospital opened in Phuket, Thailand, under the leading of A. E. Geshki, an American medical missionary. Today, Mission Hospital Phuket, as it is known, is an 83-bed hospital that last year treated over 208,000 patients. And on October 10, 1994, Joseph Cruz died at the age of 70. In 1965, he had become speaker and director of a new radio ministry called Amazing Facts. Its first program aired on a Baltimore radio station in the spring of 1966. In all, Joseph Cruz recorded 553 radio and television sermons and authored 58 books. And today, Amazing Facts is a television ministry known around the world. That was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. In the meantime, join our global conversation on Facebook and Twitter. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to more stories, photos and videos. Visit Facebook slash Adventist News or Twitter slash Adventist Church. Our good news for this week comes from Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. The passage says, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With His love He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful song. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.